Hello, I'm Andrew Henry. I'm the course coordinator and one of the instructors in Biology 111. In this course, we're going to talk a lot about the diversity of life, layering a whole bunch of different organisms onto a phylogenetic or evolutionary context. And we're also going to talk about how it fits in with the environment, providing an ecological context for the evolution of different forms. In this course, you'll have four different instructors. And that might be different than what you're used to, but the major benefit is that each of those instructors can talk about something that they're actually a specialist in. So I'm gonna talk about ecology and evolution, as well as vertebrates. Professor Melania Christescu will talk to you about invertebrate animals. Professor Jesse Shapiro will talk to you about microbes. And Professor Fiona Soper will talk to you about plants and fungi. So in this very first lecture that you're going to get, what I want to talk about is ecological complexity. And I want to talk about ecological complexity by first giving context about natural history observations about the complexity of organismal interactions that occur at my cabin, as I've been able to record on remote camera traps or uh, actually in person with GoPros or drones or uh, regular cameras. But the last time I taught the course, I was making an introductory video right here on, on this picnic table uh, at my cabin in Northern British Columbia, where I want to base a lot of the information and provide a context for the work that I talked to you about. And just after I finished making my introduction, I happened to see something in the distance. Oh, there's a bear. So that was just too perfect. So here's what let's do. First, let's watch a video of recordings from my cabin and a few other places where I talk about how bears interact with other organisms around them and how that influences the nutrients and productivity of environments in which they're found. People tend to think of bears as carnivores, presumably running around and dragging down moose and ripping them apart and eating them. And while bears do certainly kill some moose and eat them and scavenge many others. So we've just been rafting down the river and uh, I smelled something funny and saw bear tracks. And so over here is a place where there's either a bear kill or a animal that was got buried in the sand and then was dug up by uh, the bear to, to feed on. So we can have a look here. So there's the remnants of the of the moose and here's where the bear either dug it up or originally buried it and then dug it up. Bears are omnivores and omnivores are organisms that forage not just on meat or on plants but on both. So bears feed on many things in these areas. In the early spring they're often feeding on insects. So you can see they've been tearing away at the log to open it up to eat the carpenter ants. Other times of the year, in the middle of the summer, they do a lot of foraging on grass. They simply eat grass, but they'll also eat the berries of a large number of different species. Huckleberry patch. They're like blueberries. They're super, super yummy. The bears love these huckleberries. They'll come and just put their mouths up and strip along like <sighs> rip off the leaves and berries and just munch it all down mm -hmm. in this particular video here red osier dogwood uh, that is apparently poisonous to people and yet bears will eat it now we cleared out this trail here just uh, oh. less than a week ago and this tree was not here but it's been cracked down there. And so almost certainly it's been pulled down by the bear we saw the other day uh, that came through here and pulled this down to eat the ripe red osier dogwood berries. You might think that getting eaten as an organism would be a bad thing, but in reality, many organisms want to be eaten or have parts of them eaten. Berries, they're consumed by animals and then defecated somewhere else and that way they spread their seeds to another location. You can tell what a bear has been eating in their diverse diet through the year uh, by either watching them, of course. This 
but also by looking at their feces or their scats. And so here we have one here. And what you can see are berries, the remnants of berries. And you can also see grass that's in there. I told you that uh, bears like to eat huckleberries and many other berries. And here's the evidence right here. Mm -mm -mm. The remnants of uh, animal. Nice grass, yeah. Wow, very cool. In the fall, bears will forage on salmon to increase their energy uptake in leading into the winter hibernation and also where mothers give birth in dens and therefore also need to nurse their young in the, in the den. So they need a lot of nutrition and energy and that's provided by salmon. In small streams, the bears will chase after salmon and attempt to catch them while they're live and they have their most energy. There are tons of pink salmon in this creek and it's a perfect place for bears to hunt. Now, cedar's down there simulating a bear, essentially, and having no trouble catching the salmon whatsoever. But then as the fall goes on or in larger streams, bears won't be able to catch salmon that are live and rather they'll depend on scavenging car carcasses tens to hundreds of thousands of pink salmon that are in this river right now, including maybe a thousand just on our property, are all gonna die within a week. The stink will be amazing. And everything around here will basically home in and use them for, for food. My hand back here just at random and felt something wet and moist. And you can see that in fact, the salmon has been eaten here. There's just a little itty bitty bits left. Now food for yellow jackets. So the bears are rubbing on here. <clears throat> the bears are often peeing when they're rubbing. Uh, wolves will also pee here. And so you've had a little nitrogen enrichment on this lower part of the tree. I'm standing below our porch of our cabin here. And what you see is an incredible flush of the growth of grass here. Right, right along the edge of the cabin. Whereas just to the side of the porch, there isn't any uh, flush of growth like this. And of course, it's because of the local enrichment provided by us peeing off the porch. One way you could get nitrogen is by consuming animals. Of course, most plants don't do that, but some do, most famously the pitcher plant. North America and this uh, Pacific Northwest has a different kind of carnivorous plant, which is called the sundew. And there's a bunch of sundew here. So those little sticky, sticky hair-like projections at the end, they stick a little insect on them. And here's a video from a few years ago I took a bit of a time lapse of a sundew that is consuming a mosquito. We've seen a lot of cool things here over the years. Uh, moose trying to get over different parts underneath this thing. Um, but my one of my favorites is a lynx who came walking right along this cool log and then leaped off on the other side. Lynx vary dramatically in their abundance from one year to the next. As a matter of fact, they cycle. So you'll see repeated cycles of high abundance and then decreasing, then low abundance, then increasing, and then high abundance amounts of lynx. And they seem to be linked to cycles in the snowshoe hare uh, population size as well. In the fall, you see all of the animals, mostly moose, trucking their way down this trail to lower parts of the river. And then in the spring, you see them all coming back. And the wolves, of course, are trying to hunt the animals. So you can see them following the moose on each any given day, and uh, presumably trying to find calves or other weak ones that they can prey on. So I'm in my cabin and it's Sunday, which means that I will be lecturing to you in only three days and I was going through the camera traps that I've been recording this year and found a whole series of really cool videos that compiled together, represent one of these interactions that I'm talking about in class. 
And so I'm going to tack on to the end of this video, and you guys can watch the world premiere of The One-Eyed Wolf Takes His Pack Hunting.
And with the context of this introductory video then, the rest of the lecture will build on those concepts and bring those natural history observations into a more theoretical context that represents the way people talk about ecology and evolution. And biodiversity and natural history and all that cool stuff.